Welcome back to GEMS Podcast. I am the founder and host, Genesis Amaris Kemp, and with me today is Steve Boris. Here's a bit about Steve. Steve grew up in Sayville, New York, on the east end of Long Island. He attended Fordham University, where he earned a BA in history and a MAT in social studies, so master's in social studies. At Fordham, he played football and he was a team captain, two-time All-Patriot League, and an honorable mention All-American. After college, he began teaching social studies and coaching track and field at East Chester High School, New York, for the past 25 years. He also was the head football coach at Sleepy Hollow, New York, for 14 years. He currently lives in Weston, Connecticut, where he lives with his wife, Amy, daughter, Emma, son, Peter, and dog, Queenie. Steve joined the Weston High School football coaching staff in 2019, which allowed him to coach his son, and they were blessed to win a state title that same year. He published his first book, How to Beat Stalin, Hitler, and the Southern State Parkway in 2021, y'all. So just last year, Steve had dedicated his life to teaching, coaching, and public speaking as a way to pay back all of the wonderful people who have helped him survive his youth. And today, we're going to go on a personal journey with Steve. He's going to tell us about his grandmother um, upbringing in Ukraine and how that has influenced him to be the man he is today, as well as tying some of that back to his book. And then we'll bring it home front with what's going on with Ukraine and Russia today. So without further ado, please welcome Steve Boris to GEMS Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure. My pleasure, Steve. So let's start to unpack your childhood a bit, since obviously your grandmother was a great influence there. Right. Um, my, my grandmother, um, you know, was uh, actually unknown to me uh, growing up as a child. Um, we, we lived on the east end of Long Island. We moved out there from the Bronx and uh, as a way to, you know, just try to realize the American dream, you know, um, and we were, had the quarter acre house and, you know, uh, things were, things were going great until I was about five and my father and my grandmother uh, were both killed in a car wreck on the Southern State Parkway. And, you know, from there, you know, my life kind of spiraled downwards. Uh, I never got over their their passing um, from that trauma. I was learning disabled. By the time I got to middle school, I was flunking everything. I was being uh, horribly bullied, and I was kind of staring into the abyss. I was not finding reasons to get out of bed, and I was uh, thinking some unthinkable things at that point. And at the end of my rope, that's when my mom, my mother, really stepped up and and changed my life. And, you know, she was a, a great mother and she'd be like every other mother, hey, you're wonderful and everything's going to be great, you know, and you're beautiful and I love you and all that sort of thing. But you never believe your mom, right? You know, uh, they're, they're supposed to say those things. And seeing that she needed to really, you know, take the bull by the horn, so she said, well, you know what? You're not the only person ever to have adversity and face challenges in this family. So well, what are you talking about? She said, let me tell you about your Ukrainian grandmother, my father's mother, my uh, babcha. And I knew nothing about her, really. You know, she died when I was five. I only knew her as the, the wonderful woman who made apple strudel. You know, as a, as a chubby kid, you identify people by the pastry they bring to the house. And, uh, okay, well, tell me about babcha. You know, what was, this, uh, what was she uh, so wonderful? What was so wonderful about her? She said, well, she was basically a superhero. I said, what are you talking about? You know, superhero. How is Bapcha a superhero? And she said, well, well, when she was about your age, a middle schooler, or thereabouts, she, she wasn't worried about being overweight. She was actually worried about starving to death. Her and her family were victims of Stalin's Holodomor, which was uh, the Ukrainian genocide, or sometimes called the Great Hunger. 
and Stalin trying to break the Ukrainians to his will and enact the communist uh, regime and the collectivist farms, he took all the food out of the country. And millions of Ukrainians starved to death in some of the most horrific ways you, you can imagine. And the things the, that the family had to go through to survive, and not all of them made it. Uh, the, there were certainly many casualties. But the one thing that got them through was that they stayed together. And they had a belief that one day the family would rise again and have a great life. And even though they were completely powerless against this evil dictator, they could control their reactions to the situation. And they took it one day at a time. And before you know it, it was over. They had survived. And, and that's how they were going to, you know, in a way, get their revenge against Stalin. That was the family pledge, was to live a great life. And just when they were picking up the pieces, Hitler was now master of Germany. And in 1941, he unleashes Operation Barbarossa, which was the largest uh, land battle in the history of the world. It was the invasion of the Soviet Union. And there was Babcha on the front line. And her village was quickly overrun, captured. She was separated from her family, never saw another living relative again. Wow. And that had to be hard for Bobcha to digest that. Just hearing so, um, so far into this story, it's incredible just to have someone go through that and come out on the other side. I just wanted to interject that there. Sure, of course. Uh, and feel you know, absolutely ask any questions and I um, guess I'll just keep rambling on. But, no, no, uh, I'll ask some questions because I want you to yeah. paint the foundation and then mm -hmm. I'll dive into the questions because in order for us to understand Bopcha and the impact that she made on your mother, which then told you the story, then it sets us up to understand a little bit more about her and why you are now doing some of the things you're, you're doing today. Absolutely. Uh, and when she was in the camp, she, she was a slave now. And that's one that's the, the mind blowing thing was that my grandmother was a slave for Hitler, the one of the most evil people on the, in, in human history. And she was alone. Her family, her source of strength that got her through the whole of the moor was now gone. And she didn't think she was going to make it until the older women in the camp stepped up, the babushkas. You know, the woman who wore that wonderful headscarf. They came over, they saw this, this beautiful girl. And being a beautiful girl in a prison camp was not an asset. And they quickly uh, took her under their wing. And they put a babushka on her, made her hunch down and tried to hide her beauty from the German guards. And they even smeared her with a horse manure uh, as a way to deter with the bad smell any uh, attempts, attempted rapes. And these women were her angels. And that was going to be a recurring theme in Bobcha's life at, at the propitious moment whenever she was about to give in, angels would arrive and, and basically save her. And shortly into that camp, she, she found another uh, wonderful blessing. She met her husband, Eustas. And they got through that camp. They, all these people, banded together and the way they were going to resist Hitler uh, was to have a belief that one day they would have a great life again. And they were not going to give in to the hate. They were not going to give in to the fear. They were not going to let him break them. Because that's what you have to understand about uh, Hitler and, and the genocidal maniacs. It was not just to kill you, it was to break your will and ultimately erase you from history. And they were going to continue that family history. And after many more trials and tribulations in the camp, Hitler commits suicide and Bobsch is free. And her husband and, and my father are free. My father was born in the camp uh, as a slave and they outlasted the dictator again. Wow. So hearing the trials and the tribulations that your grandmother went through and then your husband 
And then um, her husband, she met him at the right time and together just having an attitude of resilience, of grit and et cetera, allow them to persevere and make it through this gruesome time in history. And then your father was born and then you being a product from your father and your mother. And when you heard these stories, how did it make, make you feel? And is this what led you to teaching history? Oh, uh, you know, absolutely. You know, um, uh, the, these stories electrified me and, and made me realize, you know, that while my problems were real, and that's what you have to understand, you know, we all have very real problems. Um, but the stories of Bapcha gave me hope, hope that I too could overcome and maybe the, the issues I had, if she could triumph over unspeakable evil, maybe I had a shot too. And, but I, the, the thing that I struggled with immediately was, okay, that's a great pep talk, right? Well, how do you actualize that? How do you bring that to fruition? How do you become anything uh, other than a total failure, which is what I was on track to be? And my mother pushed me towards football. Um, not having a dad there, I immediately found some tremendous father figures, role models, and even other players who would not let you quit. And our team had a, a motto, so to say, it was brothers forever. And that was what it was. It wasn't, we were just playing a sport. We were just trying to win a game. We were a, a true family. And, and the coaches taught us lessons to be successful in life, not just on the field. And it was those lessons that I learned on the field that, that turned my life around. Um, and I got some great teachers. I was learning, uh, classified a uh, learning disabled. And I'll never forget my uh, one great teacher, Mrs. Dudek, my special ed teacher, you know, who would about five foot tall, a hundred and nothing pounds, would get up on a chair and grab my ear and twist it and said, we're going to finish this work and you're, you know, just wouldn't let you fail. And it was the, all those folks, you know, that, that inspired me to, to get back in the fight, uh, to, to finish school, to, to excel at sports, and then to ultimately give back and become a teacher and coach and, and write this book as a way to, and to try to uh, encourage others to to uh, see that they can have hope and they too can um, make it despite the odds. And that's great whenever you have someone that is so influential in your life. So like some of the teachers that see you pass where you are currently, but they see the potential inside of you and they're willing to fight for you when you may not have the fight in you for yourself up until the point where you realize that you are worth so much more. And, um, she left an impact on you, that teacher. So that's also another reason why you probably went into teaching along with the stories of your grandmother, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a way to, uh, you know, pay, pay forward mm -hmm. um, the lessons that I was giving. And, uh, you know, and, and it's just, I couldn't think of it, uh, doing anything else with my life. And when you think about some of the things that we're seeing today in history with the war with Russia and Ukraine, and you having had a glimpse of that in your personal life via your lineage, how do you feel about what's taking place today? It's absolutely heartbreaking and just gut-wrenching, um, you know, to see that we've basically forgotten all of our history. And for things to have gotten to this point and, and forgetting all the lessons of World War II, you know, they say history um, doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. And, uh, you know, having taught history for 25 years, I've heard this tune before. And, um, you know, you have to understand who Putin is and, and what his goals and objectives are and, and uh, to seeing the horror that that he's inflicting upon uh you know my my uh my eth ethnic brothers over and sisters over there is is just uh, stupefying but um the ukrainian national anthem 
when you translate it, the first line is something to the effect of the Ukraine is not dead yet. And uh, just think about that. That's the first line of the Ukrainian national anthem or, or something to that effect. Forgive me if I have a word off or two. Uh, my Let's... Ukrainian is not great. But these are people who will not quit, mm-hmm. who will not, you know, and, and you, you may conquer them, you, you know, but they are never going to give in. They are going to find a way to, to uh, you know, have, have a great life just like my Bob did. And that is amazing. And then just to hear what you just said, that the first line is Ukraine will not quit. And then you think about the parallel with what your grandmother stood for. That also causes something to be ignited inside of you. And with you teaching your subjects um, in, in history and social studies overall, do some of the, do some of your students know about your up, your upbringing? Um, yeah, you know, I, I tie it in to um, the U.S. history lessons we teach, and I also, you know, work it in with uh, economics and government, the other course that I teach. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to, you know, especially when we talk about immigration units. I mean, and, and we encourage all the students to share their family histories and immigrant stories. And by sharing, um, I've had kids go home and, and ask their parents and grandparents, hey, what's our story? And they heard things that, that they never dreamt of. They're like, oh, my goodness, you know. Like, hey, my grandmother, my grandpa was a, was a, was a hero, too. They were superheroes, too. Um, and, and those are very important family histories that can inspire um, and that could also make us see um, ourselves in a different light. And ultimately, what I, I like to try to do with my students and teaching and teaching about Bapcha is to get people to realize we're not uh, as different as we may think. And when you look at Bapcha and her story and how she survived, it was all about love. And it was, she understood that the answer to all of our problems is now and forever will be love. And we have to get through this together. And she got through it with a lot of help, but she was able to accept the help and instead of holding on to the hatred, and she had a lot of things to be hateful about, a lot of things to be bitter about, but instead she chose to go on and have a family. And by the time she died, you know, uh, when, you know, when she got to America, she was homeless on a bench with two kids. Her husband had been murdered and uh, she picked up the pieces. And when she died, she had a, a house, she owned a small business, and she got to meet four grandkids. And, and that's how this woman, this, this you know, uh, woman from the middle of Ukraine beat two evil dictators with love. And that's something we all want. And a lot of the problems we have today is an absence of love or an absence of people feel like they're being recognized or heard or, or appreciated. And that's where a lot of our uh, anger and strife and political divisions come from. And a lot of them are manufactured. They're, they're manufactured. And when you, and that's why also sports is so beautiful. You know, playing sports and coaching sports, you know, we have kids from the Dominican Republic, this country, the Albania, you know, Every imaginable country, it's like the UN I'm coaching, you know, some of the times. And when you put them all on the same team and, and get them all doing this, they all love each other. All that superficial nonsense goes away. And the, the bond that that builds, well, if we can do it with sports, why can't we do it in all other aspects of life? And, and that's what this book is, is trying, that's my mission, that's my goal is to try to help bring people together and to see, um, you know, and hopefully that can be my contribution to, uh, to this world and in this one little way sharing the story and trying to take us one step closer in that direction.
Absolutely. And I like to say love is a four letter word that conquers all because we have all resonated with love at some point in our life. And whenever you think about the stories, your stories are making history because each one of us has a piece of the puzzle that fits with someone else's. And whenever we begin to share our stories in a transparent and vulnerable form, we're able to intersect with other people, whether they look like us or they don't. But our stories are unique to us and no one can take that away. And when you have the bravery and the courage to talk about something that may have been so heart-wrenching, but you learned and grew from that experience, then I feel like justice is being served because you conquered that. Now you could pass the torch on to somebody else to help conquer theirs. And I like how you talked about sports because there are people from all over that come together to play sports and sports is a way to unify versus divide. And the reason why I'm so passionate passionate about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, Steve, it's because I'm first generation American. My dad was from Curaçao, so right off the tip of Venezuela, and my mom is West Indies. Um, so she's from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And just seeing both of my parents from two different parts of the world come together and just blend our families together who they both came with two children and then when they got together they had me it's incredible and then I see the people in my family who are married in from different races and ethnicities it's important because if you look at the ways we are more alike than different if you begin to focus on the commonality versus the differentiators no, I couldn't agree more. And it's a beautiful family you have there. It's a, a great combination. And uh, no, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And sports is, is a great unifier. Um, and, and sports also gives you a, a purpose. And it's what we sometimes call head fake learning in education. You know, we get you out there because you think the sport's fun and it is. And we certainly want to win. Don't get me wrong. You know, we're not just uh, a bunch of... Uh, you know, sugary thinking here, but um, in the process of trying to win the game, we're actually trying to win it life. And we're equipping you. And, and it's other activities as well. Like my daughter was not into, was not an athlete at all. She, she did softball one year and almost revolted against me. And she got in the theater. And and I, by watching her perform on, on stage and, and, and talking to her, but it's the same darn thing. You know, of course, when you're reading uh, the soliloquy in Hamlet, nobody's trying to tackle you off the stage. You know, that's a difference. It's less violent. But the teamwork, the camaraderie, the connection from the star on stage singing to the person running the lights, you know, to, to every to the moms outside and dad selling uh, snacks, which was my job and my wife's job uh, during her performances. It all has to come together, a family. And yeah, you know, 99.9 .9 aren't going to go to Broadway, but they, they learn great life lessons on how to be a successful business person, a, a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, you know, what you name it. It's all the same formula. Yeah, and thank you for chiming in because sports isn't for everyone and there's so many other things where um, people can come together and unify like dance and performance art, um, theater and all of that. But one thing that I want to ask, and I'm going to go back to a history question here before we wind down is how can we make history enjoyable for middle school and high school students because sometimes they just feel like it's boring and they can't connect with the subject matter because of course we schools teach them enough information so they could pass you know certain assessments and tests but if that if that doesn't really grab a student's attention then they're going to check out and correct me if i'm wrong because i'm not a teacher my background is oil and gas in corporate america so <laughs> well, that's, that's a very important industry <laughs> we don't get much get very far without that so from, 
from your perspective, let me know what some of your thoughts are, because one of the core pillars I focus on is education, because if we're not learning, then we're not growing. It's always about and anything in life. It's about establishing a why. You know, Nietzsche once said, anybody who has a why can bear any how, right? With, uh, and that's one thing that always stuck with me. And when I start my class, especially, you know, with, with the U.S. or the economics, I say, hey, listen, you know, in a few months you're graduating and we are giving you the keys to the country. You are literally, you know, we're tossing them to you. We screwed up my generation. I'm almost 50. Uh, sorry. And forget about the boomers. Uh, God knows the boomers in their generation. Uh, but you better be ready. And so that's why we study history is not, is leadership training. You are now in charge of the country. What are you going to do with it? And, and that's why, you know, we, we study these events and, you know, all this stuff, with, uh, controversies in education. We, we tell you the facts and well, how do you feel about those things? When we talked about the genocide, the whole of the Moor and and the, and Hitler and and all the things that happened here in the United States, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What do you want to keep? What do you want to change? How are you going to lead? What is the future going to be? And so when you put it that way, when you say, "Hey, we're getting you ready to run the show," that's a whole nother dimension than saying you better memorize these facts or else. Because now it's it's about them, you know. In sales and marketing, you may know uh, me, me, me is dull, 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 right? So if it's my test, you better pass my test. Who cares? You know, you might because we're carrot and sticking you, and oh, you better you want to get into Harvard, and you don't want to, you know, be uh, you know working at a, a low wage job. So that all, but that only works so far. Um, but when we say that you have to be able to participate in this democracy and your vote matters and not participating can get you in a lot of trouble. And also, how do you deal with the media and social media? You know, you hear all these conflicting stories. Somebody's lying, but who? Somebody's full of crap. And, you know, we got to get to the bottom of that. And that's a very important life skill. And uh, being able to uh, differentiate, um, you know, the the what I like to call the professional wrestling aspects, you know, the theater, the show, the bombast, from uh, what the what the truth and reality is. Um, and then we make it about them. You know, we do a lot of projects, and we have them compete. Like you know, uh, like you're when you're in oil and gas, you know. The, they're competing against each other to make a better product. Well, maybe not the gas industry, that's more cartel, but anyway, we'll leave that one alone. Um, but, you know, competition, right? Bring it back to the sports. And we have them do projects. They have to go out on their own, you know, with certainly support. And we have a phenomenal librarian who, who does a great deal of uh, assistance for them. And, and they got to go out and, and get dirty and figure it out and not just learn it, but figure out how to present it. And, and how to sell it and, and how to uh, speak publicly and, and convince somebody. Um, you know, these are all valuable life skills, but we're doing it through the lens of, of history and, and economics. And, and hopefully, you know, I still do, I put people to sleep once in a while. You know, it's, it's always gonna happen, but um, you know, they, they seem to, uh, you know, appreciate it. And thank you for uh, sharing your tips and tricks on what you uh, do with your students. And I like that you start with the why and you allow them to work backwards because you're giving them control by telling them if you establish your why, then you're going to you're going to be able to navigate your future and create the path that you want. And then you also bring in some of the stuff that's taking place and allow them to find out the differentiation the differentiators what's real what's fake what matters what doesn't matter and then you give them the life skills to unpack that because those life skills they're going to need in their day-to-day -day hustle and bustle when they get out in the real world so as we wind down steve i want you to leave the listeners and viewers with your call to action for this segment um 
Sure. You know, I, I wrote this book um, and I got it done pretty much during the pandemic when we had a lot of extra free time because of, uh, you know, there was no going out or, or fun. And I saw my family struggling with depression. I was depressed. Family, you know, one of my best friends, uh, you know, didn't make it. And um, this was my way to contribute. Um, and it was also a way to uh, share my mother's voice one more time. You know, one of the um, parts of the book is that right when I was about to be successful and get into college, uh, my mother, who was such an inspirational source to me, uh, was also killed in a car wreck. And uh, that's what I want the readers to understand was that there's always going to be the next challenge in your life. But you control how you respond to it. And I wanted to bring back my mother's voice. A lot of the book is conversations with my mother, and she was the wisest person I ever met. And one of the things she always stressed to me was, you can have what you want, or you can have excuses why you don't have it. And you're in control. And so no matter how great the challenge is, whether it's like me losing parents, Babcha, fighting evil dictators, COVID, losing a job, the divorce, whatever it is, you control your response to it. And if you attack it with love, you get the right help, whether it's great friends, a great spouse, a great business partner, a psychiatrist, whatever it may be, um, get back in the fight, hold on, your angels are on their way. The bad things that are happening to you aren't fair, but we can get through it together. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. And I am sorry for your loss. I know what it's like to lose a parent. I lost my dad in November of 2020 and it still stings and hurts like hell. Um, so I just wanted to extend my um, condolences and also my resonance with you. So Steve, how can our listeners and viewers connect with you on social media? And do you have a website? Sure. Um, you can find me on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's Steve Boris, B-O-R-Y-S. You can check out my book. Uh, it's through Page Publishing. And you can find it on Amazon um, or uh, Barnes & Noble, real easy. It's called How to Beat Stalin, Hitler, and the Southern State Parkway. And uh, if you ever want to email me and, and chat and start a relationship, it's Steve dot boris b-o-r-y-s at gmail.com and um, i'm always happy to talk you know if you lost a parent and, and you want to chat i know all about that and uh we got to be there for each other whether we're best friends or we just met you know the only way we're going to get through this is with love and there you have it, listeners and viewers of Jump's podcast. You just heard Steve Boris. All of his contact information will be in the show notes. Until we chat next time, remember, love, a four-letter word that conquers all. Love will pass through your life. Love is a part of you. And love is something you could extend unto someone else. Let's intersect with the power of love. Let's allow our lights to illuminate, illuminate someone else's life. Let's continue to rise up and fight for what's right and never stop because the going gets tough. So until we chat next time, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Don't forget to subscribe and share this segment. We're on 40 plus platforms and follow us on YouTube at Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp for all things video content. Until next time, ciao.